So I didn't know how large the crowd who would be a fan of bartenders and winemakers would be who would show up at 9 in the morning on a Friday. We may not have the biggest numbers here. We have the handsomest crowd, clearly. And with our esteemed director, Carter Sneed, and Father Kimes, and Abe Scherner, we've got the best collection of scarves. <laughs> um, I have, in addition to my priestly vocation, the avocations of being a lawyer and doing some work with America's bartenders. And people ask me about from time to time, and the way I want to think about why I'm excited to be for this panel is to say that, well, most lawyers are miserable, uh, and that's because most lawyers toil <coughs> the middle of the hour to make money by helping Google settle patent disputes with uh, Apple, right? And that's not exciting. The happiest lawyers I knew were, uh, that I worked with were U.S. Um, federal prosecutors and they said they were happy because they didn't have to toil for Google or for money, but they would wake up in the morning trying to do the right thing. And that's a better way to be a lawyer. But better still than even being a lawyer is to wake up in the morning and think about how to make something delicious and how to make people delighted on a Thursday night or a Friday morning, as is the case for us. And so uh, with that background, I'm delighted to be moderating this panel with good friends of the Center for Ethics and Culture and good friends of mine. Just take them in the order in which they will appear, and as they are seated uh, furthest to my right is Jim Meehan. Jim is a bartender, author, educator, co-founder of the New York City Cocktail Lounge, which to all the world looks as though it's a prohibition era speakeasy, but which for reasons that remain mysterious to me, he denies is a speakeasy. But you have to sneak through a phone booth to get inside. Uh, PDT is a wonderful 34-seat bar uh, hidden behind a uh, wonderful hot dog shop um, called Crip Dog. No more will I say about Crip Dog until we're upstairs. I want to describe to you the sign that tells you that you are a Crip Dog. Um, this is in the East Village in New York City, and PDT has been open eight years ago. It's in its eighth year, and each year it's ranked as one of the world's very finest cocktail bars. It's quiet, it's reserved, people behave well there, and the drinks are extraordinary, which is why it won the first ever uh, Beard, James Beard Award for a cocktail program. Um, it won the Tales of the Cocktail Spirited Awards for World's Best Cocktail Bar in 2009. Last year at those same awards, Jim won his, I don't know, 17th award. This time, I think it was the best one. It was um, the Mentor of the Year Award because uh, what Jim's business does uh, is operate ethically and as a, a family, and people come up through it and they're loyal to it and they learn a lot from him about being hospitable. Uh, he has also edited eight editions of the Food and Wine Magazine's annual cocktail book, has written for the New York Times, Imbod, Bon Appetit, and GQ.com. He's the author most recently, unless you finally get send on the new book, okay, he's the author most recently of the PDT cocktail book, which also won the Spirited Awards for the best cocktail book, 2011. <laughs> uh, so that's Jim Behan. Alex Pitts. Jim Meehan's slight left is co owner and winemaker at, how do you pronounce the name of your name? Maitre de Chais. Maitre de Chais. I was going to say something just like that. Uh, <laughs> in St. Helena, California, uh, and an assistant winemaker at the Scolian Project, about which more in a second, in Fairfield, California. He's worked under award winning chefs throughout California, including Douglas Keene, Nicole Blue, Thomas Keller, and Tim Hollingsworth. Uh, last and by no means at least, Abe Scherner has spoken uh, in a variety of contexts for us here at the center uh, in the last several years. Abe is the founder and winemaker at the Scolian Project in Napa Valley. He received his doctorate in classics, Greek classics, I believe. Uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Ancient Greek philosophy, that's right, from the University of Toronto, and was formerly a tutor in the classics at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, where he most famously taught Carter Sneed. He and his revolutionary wines have been profiled in the New York Times, Esquire, Food Republic and elsewhere. Uh, enough for me. Let's hear from Jim. Should I speak in here? Are you guys okay with that, or should I get a phone from you? Can you, can you just roll my uh, my footage for this? We, we, we want to hear you very well. All right, so I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, we need to. Ah, just put on that heart. <laughs>
Uh, 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 you can see based on our, our choice of computer where we're at. Normally I just go off the cuff, but this uh, I'm wading into the intellectual deep end here, so I'm going to try to stay organized with uh, something where you can follow along. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Carter and Father Bill for inviting me back again. Um, this is, as a kid growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, there were as many flags flying for Notre Dame as there were for the state of Illinois, the uh, United States of America, or the city of Chicago. So this is the equivalent of a, a young kid from Chicago, go, as close as I'll ever get to going to Notre Dame, uh, which makes my parents, I'm sure, very happy. Um, I was, uh, last year, it was very interesting, the, the subject of the conference was poverty. So you can only imagine when uh, Carter and Father Bill asked me to come speak, it was uh, an interesting challenge to speak on poverty when, as a bartender, uh, I basically live off of the largesse of others. Uh, so I was at first pleased when I heard that the, the topic was freedom. Uh, as, as in my position as a bar operator and someone who works in the drinks business, I, I, I got to thinking, well, freedom will be easier than poverty, and then I actually started thinking about this subject, and I was like, oh dear. Um, so, hearing that, that um, Abe would be back on the panel, I didn't realize, uh, I've drank Abe's wines for years, but I had no idea that he was a classics professor and Carter's professor until I sat down at the table with him last year. I immediately reached out to Abe to figure out where he was going to be going with his talk, uh, and he mentioned a, a, a passage from the Bible, one which uh, to the disappointment of my parents that I was unfamiliar with. So I began thinking uh, about the Bible and about passages that I was familiar with, and one passage which has always really sort of resonate, resonated with me throughout the course of my life and my professional career I'll read next. Uh, the topic of what I'll be talking about is I'm, I'm loosely calling or tightly calling the economics of freedom, uh, Jesus' tip, uh, and a little preamble to this. For those of you who are probably not as engaged in the bar and restaurant business as I am, uh, Danny Meyer, who's probably the most famous restaurateur in, in New York and one of the uh, more highly profiled ones in, the, in America, is, is calling for an end to tips in the service industry. And it's something that's being taken, looking at very closely, uh, and something I don't really have time to go into detail about, uh, but you can imagine uh, having paid for my college education and uh, basically uh, underwritten most of my modern life and tips how I feel about getting rid of them. Uh, so here I'll be talking about what I see is what I interpret as one of Jesus' tips. Uh, I'll read this passage from Luke 20:26, 20, uh, a famous passage which was profiled in other places in the Bible. Uh, it was a passage where Jesus was being interrogated by people who were trying to trap him. Uh, they were going to trap him eventually, uh, but here they were trying to catch him up on something that they know they could uh, trap him more easily, and it was something that had to do with taxation, something that had to do with uh, Pilate. Uh, so they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something that he had said, so as to deliver him up to the authority and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly, and show no partiality, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? 
They said, Caesar's. He said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Uh, my interpretation of this passage, and obviously there are many famous uh, interpretations, which I didn't read in order to uh, cloud a very simple interpretation of this, is here we see Jesus' semantic ingenuity in the face of his crafty critics. Uh, I feel like Jesus could have taken this head on, probably, and, and taken a very righteous stance against the nature of this uh, inquisition, and, and he was crafty and said. Um, Jesus distinguishes God's tribute from the state's, Caesar's, uh, and in this, he destabilizes, what I would say, he destabilizes the value of physical currency. What he's essentially saying here is that this tribute or tax to God uh, is presumably more valuable than the tribute that they were trying to catch him up that was to Caesar. Uh, and in that sense, my interpretation or my guess, because Jesus doesn't explain what this tax to be paid is, is that it would be a non-denominational, and I don't mean this by God, but I mean by currency, spiritual currency, <coughs> presumably measured by ethics, morality, or devotion. He does not say. Um, and in this, I feel like this passage, as I step back from it, is a vision of earthly versus spiritual wealth, uh, and an implicit calling to audit one's resources. I imagine when he said this to these inquisitors who were trying to catch him up, that he was catching them, he was forcing them to think about a tax that they probably obviously were not paying. Uh, <coughs> as I bring this back into my own life, as I, and sort of bring you into to my world and the way I think, um, I wanted to look at what a, what a bartender does, or what, I, what I've done for my living, both uh, in a very earthly, sort of nuts and boltsy way, and then in a more metaphysical, uh, more deeply meaningful way. So if you look at the, the brass tacks of what a bartender does, uh, which we could call service loosely, um, a bartender serves earthly goods, food and drink. Uh, they work in a fast-paced work environment. Um, that environment is unique in, its, in that it's culturally and economically diverse. Uh, oftentimes, the, the staffs that I've worked with come from all walks of life, and the, and the guests in which we're serving are also from all walks of life. Um, and what we do, from a brass tax point of view, is we cultivate new and repeat business through the expedient delivery of earthly goods. You go to a restaurant, the idea is someone orders food and drink, you get it to them as quickly and neatly as possible. Uh, it's a simple transaction, but, but maybe not. Um, and bartenders and waiters are compensated with the low, lowest wages in the country, which is why uh, Danny Meyer and many are looking at the, the wage situation and, and looking at tips in general. Uh, if we look at, we look at the, the calling uh, for those of us who, who work beyond the years of perhaps waiting tables or bartending in college to pay for clothes and books. Um, the bartender's vocation, what I'll call, is is to hospitality, and this gets to the sort of hospitality that Father Bill was sort of hinting at earlier, and that is um, hospitality in the service of food and drink. And, and going back to my previous slide, this notion of working in a chaotic environment where you, you know, as a waiter, you might get seated with six tables or 10 people might walk into the bar at the same time, you're not just prioritizing or figuring out who to serve and when to serve and how to serve them, you're governing that environment. Uh, you're making all these people feel comfortable together. It's, you're making them feel together, as opposed to just serving them all in the same room. Um, and in that, you're cultivating new and repeat business through the development and maintenance of relationships. Uh, one of the things I've learned in my sort of later years in the bar business is we're not really in the drinks business or in the food business. We're in the relationship business. And that, that requires you as a server or a bartender to develop uh, and nurture more meaningful and deep relationships with your guests. Sometimes in, in a, in a you know, initially in a superficial way, but eventually as you get to know them or serve them longer in, in a deeper way. Uh, and that compensation, the, the depth in relationships you build with your guests, is not something that's easy to be measured in earthly wealth.
Um, so the comparison between this notion of earthly and spiritual wealth. Um, getting to this idea of tips, which I don't have time to address in, in its entirety and my feelings on it, in some ways I see these tips as a hospitality tax, not earned from a percentage of sales, uh, your 15% or 20% tip, but then left in appreciation of efforts above and beyond the call of duty. Oftentimes people leave a, a tip not just because you delivered their food or because you delivered the drink or gave you the check when you asked for it, but because of the way in which you did it. Uh, one of the things that I always think about is Maya Angelou's quote, uh, which goes something along the lines that, you know, people will forget what you said and forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I feel like some of the best servers in the way in which they do their job make us feel good uh, as opposed to just serve us, nourish us, literally. Um, and, and in many ways, going back to what I said earlier, the difference between tips and the, the payment that we receive as waiters or bartenders is the difference between our material poverty or wealth, depending on the nature of the bar or restaurant we work in. Um, what I wanted to get into, which is something which we don't talk about very often outside of the industry, is the these tips are often supplemented with gratuities laid down in absence of a full bill. Uh, this And this was kind of, you're probably wondering, well, where is he going to talk about freedom? Uh, I took this quite literally uh, and wanted to talk about literally free goods, and I'll get into something a little bit more, but uh, free goods, food and drinks served without charge or comps, short for complimentary in the industry, are one of the most important decisions bartenders make typically with the blessing of management. Who gets comped and why? How do they get comped? How frequently do they get comped? What's comparable or appropriate to give away? Uh, and I could go into some of the things you may not know about bars or restaurants, but my dear friend, Father Bill here, <laughs> is the beneficiary of um, what I would call my comp policy at PDT. Uh, very early on in, in the opening of my bar, the, the main thing that I was concerned with was the X's and O's of service. I was concerned whether or not my staff was going to be able to make the drinks the way that I wanted them to be made, or to serve the guests the way that I wanted to be made. I was very, very concerned about the, just the superficial <coughs> service in my bar. And I quickly realized with just a 34 seat bar that has no door that is visible to people, that the most important thing would be who came to my bar, not just how they were served in it. And in this sense, my greatest calling or my greatest task over the last eight years is to make sure to draw a diverse audience of people to gather in my bar and to enrich it by their very presence. And some of those people can't afford to order $15 cocktails all night long. And the comp policy, this notion of free goods, is, is a way in which I'm able to get the right people in the, in the bar. And I don't mean this in a studio. Uh, 54. <laughs> Comps then historically have been more to do with the, have had more to do with the success of the bars I've run in my own career advancement than any other thing I've sold. Um, I've always used Jesus' parable here to measure the ethicality of my comps to ensure my generosity was the best in the interest of the business as well. Obviously, for those of you who have ever attended bar before, you saw maybe a cute boy or a girl and thought, "Wow, oh, I should buy them a drink and maybe we could have a little conversation." Or your roommate comes in every night and expects you to give him a free drink. Or, um, you know, there are many reasons in which you would give a drink away that I would consider to be selfish or to the detriment of the bottom line of the bar. And, and these aren't the sort of comps I'm talking about. Um, these comps that I'm talking about are the ones that I've given away uh, for the right reasons for the bar and for myself. And these, these, uh, these free drinks, let's just call them, have made me rich, although not financially. So my sermon, uh, which is sacrilegious, I realize to say here, uh, is that I believe Jesus is encouraging us to pay taxes on our earthly and spiritual wealth and leaves the nature of this duty open to our interpretation because he has faith in us, which fosters our faith in others. God gave us his only son, and this gesture is the ultimate model for spiritual tribute. As I said before, he, he tells us we have to pay this tax, but he doesn't really explain how or, or what or how much. Uh, and, and for me, I feel like I can only look, step back, and think of what 
the sort of tax might be based on God's offering of his son to us. Um, that free drinks cost money to give away are one example of how freedom isn't free. Uh, and, and if ethically sound and intent, as I mentioned before, the gesture is more valuable than the cost of the drinks to the bar and the recipient. And I feel like in this sense, the gesture parallels, obviously on a much lower uh, level, uh, God's gesture and God's gift. Uh, and I'll step back further and say that the, this gesture and this gift means more because it is your choice versus your obligation to do so. And in conclusion, uh, to sum up, Caesar's tax was known and God's via this Bible passage is far less explicit. Jesus left God's duty open for us to interpret freely. There's a little freedom. God's gift is his only son for us to, to do as we wish with is the ultimate model of generosity and that Jesus' teachings tip us off that the currency with which God's taxes are to be paid is from a faith-based generosity which enriches those who give and receive selflessly based on our faith in others. It's, an, it's a tidy and complicated little conceit and I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Thank you. to the, uh, the fall conference for a few years as a spectator. This is my first time speaking. And I'm thankful, as is Jim, that it is freedom that we're talking about because there's so many facets of creativity and freedom, and sometimes these words are used interchangeably. So I want to talk about something that may seem slightly counterintuitive to freedom, and that's the fundamentals. It's something that time and time again fascinates me when I get to a point where I want to create, then I look back at these, these fundamentals. So before I started making wine, as Father Daly said, I was a chef and I'd worked for several years in fine dining restaurants all over Northern California. And I took a job at the French Laundry in Napa, California, the three Michelin star restaurant that in many ways changed the way Americans dined in these sorts of restaurants. This French approach where there are 20 plus courses, the dinner takes hours, and there is attention in every step of this whole entire service. When you take a job at the French Laundry, you don't start on the line, as they say, cooking for people. You start as a commis, spelled C-O-M-M-I-S. And this commis is essentially the, the bottom rung of the ladder, which is a humbling experience, because next to me were people that ran whole restaurant groups and chefs with all of their own accolades, and here we were taking out trash and peeling carrots again. And you can imagine the frustration that comes with having to start over and doing these tasks that seem so mundane. One of these tasks that sticks out in my mind is chicken stock. This idea of taking chickens whole or half or pieces, cooking them in water and vegetables, and getting this liquid that you can use in many ways all over the kitchen. And I remember seeing it on my prep sheet for the day thinking, oh, come on, I can't possibly be meant to make chicken stock. This is uh, way beneath me. And not only did I have to make it that day, I would have to make it every day for months on end. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating, and it was frustrating. I 
digress a little bit to talk about the role of the butcher in this, in this story. The butcher in many places acts almost as the sage. He is a man with a lot of recipes and techniques, but he is, in a way, not in the spotlight. He's in the back. He comes in early in the morning. He leaves before the service starts. And this butcher shared with me something that has become my philosophy that perhaps is my greatest value add to both Scolian Project and, and, and a lot of things that I do. And it's this co concept of mise en place. It means technically putting things in their place. And this concept of mise en place is something that for him, he found truly beautiful. And for him, this mise en place was the way to enlightenment with my boring chicken stock making. So how I mean is you would come in to this day, and I knew that this had to be done, and every step I, I mapped out in my head, every turn that I would make, every label that would be placed, and then it started to be becoming a game, and I got better. And that moment when all of the steps and movements have been choreographed and they're in your head, that is that freedom, that is that creativity part, that you can start tweaking little things to make every little step better. I started, when I left the kitchen and started winemaking with Abe, it was a completely foreign concept to me. I had no training in winemaking. I had no real understanding of the chemistry other than what I had read and been told. But what I did have was this concept of mise en place. So I was able somewhat quickly to use these tools of seeing a, seeing a project, seeing it through, and that's where, over the years, the creativity part, the freedom part, had kind of taken over. As I was researching this topic a little bit, there's a doctor, his name's Ron Friedman, and he writes extensively about this. He's a workplace consultant, and he authored the book, The Best Workplace. And he has a lot of quotes that are really interesting. One that I liked is something that maybe is a little more easily relatable. He says, what's the first thing you do when you arrive at your desk in the morning? For many of us, checking email or listening to voicemail is practically automatic. In many ways, these are among the worst ways to start a day. Both activities hijack our focus and put us in a reactive mode where other people's priorities take center stage. They are the equivalent of entering a kitchen and looking for a spill to clean or a pot to scrub. <clears throat> this, this idea that you start the day <coughs> behind the ball, many of us have felt it, I'm sure, and it really can ruin a day and sometimes it can ruin a whole project, whatever that project is. I, I don't mean this to be self-helpy, this talk, but it's, it's just a, a philosophy that may, may help. So what I hope to share is that when you sit down to whatever project next Monday or next work day, is that maybe spend 10 to 15 minutes kind of going through a mental checklist of how your day is going to go this mise en place of your day. Look at the moves that are going to be necessary to really be successful. And it, it comes with a certain level of gratification too when these things kind of happen in the way that you would plan. You can envision being halfway through your day at the precipice of creating something great, or right there about to have that aha moment and you reach for that tool or that thing that you had planned to put there all along, and then you just continue to work. And that, that is pretty, um, that's a pretty big moment. It takes, uh, it takes a lot 
it takes a lot to stop at that moment, remove yourself from the situation, have to go fix something else, and then come back and think, where was I? It's this concept that I um, am talking about. I know how far from freedom it may seem, but when, when you're able to remove all of those impediments, that's where the real freedom of creati creativity lies for me. Thank you. specific and kind of narrow and it's a preliminary investigation for me so I'm going to lay out my early thinking and my early questions on this and in future conferences through different lenses I will continue to explore this. I'm very excited. One of the central moments in what I'm going to tell you stretches back uh, to a time when I was a teacher at St. John's College where Carter and I were together we played a lot of soccer together and worked in some classrooms together. It's um, such a pleasure to be tied to Notre Dame through St. John's. Very interesting also for me to reflect on that, the relation between the two places. So in particular, what I want to talk about in relation to freedom are questions about dietary prohibitions, about what we may and may not eat. And um, maybe the central question about human freedom, as posed by the Bible, is tied to what we may and may not eat. I'm not going to look at that, but I'm going to look at um, <laughs> the permission to eat fish on Friday in the absence of other kinds of meat. And I'm going to look at it through um, a few moments in Genesis. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some things that um, I'm sure you're very familiar with, but I think I, I'm, I might recast them in a somewhat different way as a beginning for this investigation. So on the fifth day of creation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use quotations from the King James Version. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. It's interesting to me that um, here on this day, the talk is of filling the air and the sea, and it's only on the next day that we get to the land. And I want you, I think I want you to use your imagination, not just to listen to the words, but to think of what it means to fill the land and, and the sea. Sorry, to fill the air and the sea. And then the next day, he creates the living things that inhabit the face of the earth. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, everything that creepeth upon the earth after his coming, and God saw that it was good. And now what I want to point out is on uh, the previous day, there's talk of filling air and sea, but not filling the land. And that's because the land is so different. The air and the sea are three dimensions in that volume. And the land, no matter what its contours are, is essentially flat and has two dimensions. There's no filling of the they're spreading out upon the land, which is a very important concern at many different stages, but no filling. And the other thing I want to point to is this really interesting word, and I, I wish I knew Hebrew. At some point, um, before I stop giving these talks, I will know Hebrew. And I wish I really knew what the word that is translated creep uh, means. But it's really clear to me that in this verse, there's a focus on the way in which the animals that inhabit the face of the earth, the way in which they move. And I think the same thing is true retrospectively about the fish and the fowl. Namely, if one thinks about what it means for them to fill the air and to fill the sea, one has to think about the way that they move, the way that they move in three dimensions. And uh, I'm now going to point to something that has recently inhabited my imagination. I saw a very fun movie recently, The Martian. And um, the movie takes great delight in presenting the way in which the captain of a certain space uh, 
a certain space mission moves through her vessel when it is in the middle of space. And a movie critic compared her motions to the motions of a mermaid, which seemed absolutely appropriate <coughs> to me. What the movie figures out how to do is to present a human being, which is normally bound to the surface of the earth, bound by his or her feet, and, and occupies space in a vertical plane. What the movie has figured out how to do is to turn this person into a fish and to show what it would mean to be a human being and to move in the realm of the fish. And if you think about the way that birds move, they move not so differently in their own realm from the way that fish move in theirs. The human beings, and then all the things that creep on the face of the earth, they move very differently. And now, immediately after this talk of filling two volumes and then things that creep, God makes clear what everything eats. He says, and to every animal of the earth and to every fowl of, of the heavens and to everything that creepeth on the earth, in which is a living soul, every green herb is given for food. This is so interesting to me. It's not, I think, surprising, or maybe I should say not shocking, that uh, no animals eat each other yet. The only things that are consumed are vegetable matter. What's really interesting to me is after pointing explicitly to fish and fowl in one verse, and to things that creep in another verse, in this verse when the subject of eating comes up, nothing is said of the fish. And I think that this is not merely a, a pesky question. I think it's a question that has the possibility of leading to more substantial questions, but perhaps only later. Let me pause to review some features of these divisions. Animals are opposed to plants. Plants and their seeds are food. Animals are not food, even for other animals. For some reason, flying things and fish come first. Creeping things that live on the earth are created on a separate subsequent day. And now what I want to point to is not just to the way in which these things inhabit space, but the physiological consequences of the way they inhabit space. And this, in turn, is tied to a question from daily life. This might be true of many of you. I have some friends who are vegetarians, some friends who are pescatarians, and some friends who eat everything. And I have often asked myself, why is it that some people will choose to eat one kind of flesh and not another? Why are there some people who are friends of mine who are really careful thinkers, and also in some ways seekers of pleasure, not that those things are opposed. And um, those, some of those people will choose to eat the flesh of fish and not the flesh of land animals. And it occurred to me at one point that there really is a very different nature to these fleshes. And there are some kinds of sea flesh that come close to intersecting animal flesh, in particular tuna, I, I can't imagine eating whale. It's been presented to me once or twice. I know what it looks like, but I know, don't know what it feels in the mouth, like in the mouth. But it doesn't look to me like lamb flesh. But tuna can, partly because of its pinkness, but for other reasons too. But this seemed to me maybe the fundamental difference, and it's related to something that I pointed to before. Lamb flesh exists. It, is tied to the skeletons of things that have to support themselves in gravity. And in a certain sense, have to push themselves up off the surface of the earth or support themselves. So consequently, everything that lives on the land has substantial legs. Legs are the kind of physiological expression of this relationship to the earth and relationship to gravity. Whereas birds have famously spindly legs and if you think of land, I'm sorry, sea mammals like the whale, the whale has, if you look at a whale skeleton, has these hilarious vestigial legs and arms. The, once, you become, once you become part of the realm of um, the air or the sea, then the importance of legs really disappears. And the flesh that goes with that changes. The flesh of things that move like this whether it's through the air or the sea, is very different from the flesh of things that have to support themselves on the face of the earth. So I just want to draw that distinction, put it in your mind, and then move beyond it. We're going to jump ahead to the flood. I have had the sense for a long time that many people ask for many different reasons 
what happens to the fish in the flood? And in particular, it seems to me that if you kind of hunt around um, on the internet to see what other people have thought about this question, it's brought up very often by people who think that the flood is a ridiculous story, and what's especially ridiculous about it is the question of what happens to the fish, because the flood is not a very good instrument for destroying the fish. And I've read some, uh, I guess you might call them apologetics, that point out that it would be very, very bad if you were a freshwater fish to be overwhelmed by <laughs> seawater. It seems to me a weak apology to <laughs> But um, what seems to me maybe a little bit more interesting and, and maybe more helpful is, is to notice, it, uh, again, the way that, that God speaks in advance of this. In um, chapter 6, he says, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls and the fowl of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. And it's very interesting that once again there's silence on the fish. Just as we never hear what it is the fish are to eat, we don't hear that the fish are going to be destroyed. To push this further, now I have to return to the moment I alluded to at the beginning of my talk, a moment at St. John's College a long time ago when I was a teacher there. And in the very last year in which I taught at St. John's, um, there are almost no electives at St. John's. In your junior and senior year, you're allowed to take an elective that only lasts half a semester. So your whole career at St. John's College, two electives, each one of which lasts only half a semester. So you have one elective, one semester of elective study at St. John's. And the teachers also are not allowed to choose what they teach. They're assigned classes, and you teach through the program. And if you can't teach in every aspect of the program, you don't get to teach there. So it's uh, very exciting for the students and the teachers to be able to propose electives. And I asked in what happened to be the last year that I taught there to lead a class on Genesis, uh, an elective class on Genesis. And I was in the reading room, uh, kind of the reference room of the library one day, looking through um, some copies of the Old Testament. And I was leafing through, and I really don't even know why I turned to it, a German Bible of about the 17th century that was richly illustrated with woodcuts, and I turned to chapter 9 and saw an illustration the likes of which I had never seen before and never expected to see. So in chapter 9, as you will remember, the waters have receded and the winds have dried out the surface of the earth, and the illustration shows Noah and maybe his sons, I remember one human figure, maybe more, standing on a landscape littered with carcasses. It's something that we're never invited to imagine, what the surface of the earth looked like after the waters had receded. And this question seems to me a very, very important question, and it's a very important question, especially in relation to what, I don't know how to address it, Professor Brog, is that the right way? Professor Brog, the question that he raised last night about the relationship between beginnings and freedom. What kind of beginning is it? What kind of new beginning is it for the world if when you step out of the ark to begin the world again, your land is littered with human corpses or with the carcasses of animals. So this was the first time this question had ever been raised in my mind. It was raised by a woodcut. And so I decided to flip around more and to see what this crazy artist, what else he had imagined. And only a chapter or two before, in an illustration of the early stages of the flood, you see an image which is really similar to other images of the flood, thousands of which existed on woodcuts in which you can imagine. Imagine a woodcut of some houses floating in water and some animals kind of, you know, with their legs up in the air there in the last stages before they drown. There might or might not be a human being in this picture, depending on what the artist can tolerate. This is the common image. What this crazy guy had added to it were fish and sea monsters eating the animals and the I pause at this, I don't know what to make of it. I'm going to leave it at the level of something like suggestion. It seems to me that all of these strange questions about what the fish eat and, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> that there something, there are amazing possibilities that deserve inquiry. Having pointed to this, having pointed, I'll say it explicitly, to this possibility that 
before God gives human beings the, I'll call it right, but I'm not sure if that's the right word, before he gives human beings the right finally to eat the flesh of animals, it looks like it's possible that fish might already be eating the flesh of other fish and the flesh of animals. Very strange and, and interesting thing. In the moment of that, sorry, what I should say is very interesting that all of this is raised in a kind of silent way before there's an explicit change in what it is permissible to eat. And so at this moment, um, in Genesis, there are really no questions of dietary restrictions to look ahead to the notion of fasting and what it is permissible to eat on a fast day. I want to I want to I want to suggest that the traditional view, if I'm not mistaken, once human beings are allowed to eat meat, and then once there is a requirement to fast and to step back from the eating meat. The traditional view, if I'm not mistaken, is the reason that fish come to the fore is because they're bloodless. Uh, I hope that that's true. Someone will correct me. There's um, an interesting line from the Council of Jerusalem that counsels against consuming anything with blood or anything that you have to strangle. And one of the very interesting things about fish as a food, as a, a living thing, as food, if you imagine what it's like to harvest a bunch of fish and to bring them from the sea to your coastal town and then to bring them to the marketplace, they're dead by the time you get them to the marketplace and you don't have to strangle them. So this seems to me one very strong possible advantage of fish. In, in other words, the, the eating of fish is never connected to slaughtering. You could, you could use the kind of tame term harvesting them and use the same language that you use of harvesting fruits and vegetables. And in some way you'd be kidding yourself, but on the other hand, it's not wholly false. There's no abattoir necessary for fish. But what I would like to suggest is there's something else that is related not to slaughtering and not to blood, but to questions of freedom and then to the questions that I raised at the very beginning of the talk about the way of life of these animals. What if what is special about the flesh of fish is tied not to the way in which we harvest or slaughter them, but if it's tied to the way in which the fish themselves live and the relation of the fish to the earth and the relation of fish to what we might call gravity? What if what is special about the flesh of fish is the flesh of something that moves in a certain way and lives in a certain way? And that's where I think I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. I'll say this little thing in relation to what Alex said. It seems to me that in, in asking about freedom in almost any context, one always has to ask about discipline. I've always thought about the two in relationship to each other. And I think I have, I have not, since I was maybe 16, been interested in freedom that was opposed to discipline, but that was somehow shaped by it. And so I must say I admired that very much in Alex. Well, can I say, first of all, this is an extraordinary uh, session, actually. I mean, it's entirely unpredicted, at least on my part, but I, I wonder what I was going to do. <laughs> this, uh, this strikes me as extraordinary uh, and uh, wonderful, actually, was the first thing to say. Uh, and I'm immensely grateful for it. I mean, it it's very fine uh, and interesting. Contributions in, if I may say, struck me as Zen spirit. <laughs> we are a to be, but this seems to be as well the Zen of bartending, the Zen of fish and so on. So, that, and I was thinking, you know, what, what, how, what might tie these together and what would be a thought? So here's a suggestion, and I'd just be interested in what you have to say about this. You might say that there's a kind of existential challenge that faces all human beings, and it just comes with the condition under which we live, which are those of coming into a world that we didn't make, under conditions we didn't choose. 
and in circumstances over which we have very little control. And you might say, what faced with all of that ought one to do? And the answer might be, and it's a very general form of answer, would be to cultivate a demeanor that allows one to live under those conditions with something like grace or dignity and so on. And recognizing that what sort of binds us together then is not a kind of world of rights and entitlements, but vulnerability. And so there's a sort of solidarity that emerges from the fact that we all have to sort of do what we can under these conditions. And it struck me that in a way, each of you could be seen to be talking about the cultivation of a certain kind of demeanor. I mean, the demeanor of the service that comes in the bar and, and with the complexity of the lives of those who serve, those who consume food, in a way are subject to the same gravitational weight of living under conditions they didn't choose in certain times of them. And then try to as well, graciously make one's way through that. And then again I thought the sort of the placement, you know, that as it were, the, the, the Zen moment as it were of choreographing the movement that are going to take you through making the and then actually I was reminded of um, Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection, you know, who were we working uh, uh, you know, working in the kitchen and so on, and this becomes his spiritual work. And then I thought that the issue of the fish suggested to me again a kind of, and this wasn't one of your themes, but you might want to think of it, the sort of grace of the fish or the bird of the air, you know, as in contrasting with this sort of being. I mean, they're all subject to gravity, right? But in a sense, the creeping things are burdened by this in a way that the, the, the animals Yeah, the fish are buoyed up. The fish are buoyed up by it. <clears> so <throat> so, like. so I, I suppose what I think from this was a sort of, Homily to grace, in a way, uh, to, to carrying the weight that inevitably we, we do carry, but in a way that is the word is poised and gracious and, and brings surface with it and so on. So I don't know if you want to react to that. I think, you know, as I like to think back to the passage that I chose, that, you know, the way in which Jesus responded and the way in which I think you guys have responded to the subject of freedom involved being crafty involved having a sort of, not a subversive mindset in a bad way, but a, 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 a stepping back and then understanding, as you're saying, the, the circumstances under which we are subject to, to the possibility of freedom are challenging and require a, uh, a path to, to navigate it that is uh, thoughtful and correct. I want to speak quickly to what Abe said because what got me thinking about my, my approach was going back and, and reading about the Code of Hammurabi and, and Ur-Nammu and these, these civilizations that set up codes for themselves and laws. And at that point, it seemed like we could flourish beyond just hurting each other. And, and discipline and freedom, I, I guess maybe that's really where, where all of this kind of started from. Is an interesting correlation. And I, I would like to add this in relation to something that Jim brought up that, I, that for me was the most surprising thing about his talk. I agree very much what you say about the cultivation of demeanor. I like that. I'm, I like that very much as a way of kind of stepping back and looking at what all of us were talking about. Jim said many things were not surprising to me, not just because I live and work in his world, but I really like reflecting on it. I think a lot about restaurants and bars. Their lives are very interesting to me, and the way that that a well-run bar <coughs> restaurant is like a single organism, like a single animal. And the one thing that I have not thought about that you raised that is really perfect is when the gesture of the comp is self-serving and when it serves the whole. That was a really beautiful thing, I think, for you to turn our minds to. And interesting also in relation to discipline because it takes some discipline. There you are, you can give a free drink to whoever you want. It takes some discipline to stay focused on the needs of the whole. And my wife and I have been the benefactor of that comp at PDT before. <laughs> and I can say it was a uh, memorable experience. Well, thank you. Thank you.